So I have to look um, in the camera. <laughs> so. Hello, Marketa. Welcome here. <laughs> How are you today? I'm on the beach, so I'm very well. No, yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I'm fine. Thank you. What about yeah. you? Ah, oh, fine. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not at the beach, as you can see, but I'm fine as well. Okay, so I would like to know, how did you learn English so well? Well, I wouldn't say well, but uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, actually, I am um, one of the people which I think is quite rare because I basically I had no English at school whatsoever. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, very young. I, I still, you know, I grew up during the old regime, during the communist time. So I had no English at school. I actually had no language at school. At the time, uh, the language learnings was starting at the age of 10 or 11 in the fifth grade and I had Russian. So I had one <laughs> or two years of Russian and then the revolution came and we were slowly starting to learn a little bit of English. So I had about half a year of English learning at school. Uh, and, and then my family moved to, to South Africa and I started going mm -hmm. to an English school there. I could speak no English. And I just had to learn it there by listening to people, by talking to friends, to teachers, to people in the street. And that's how I learned English. And I spent quite a lot of time there and it was a very good age for learning the language. Mm -hmm. So I I think that that's how I learned, how it became really a part of me. And it's my second nature today. Mm -hmm. But I've forgotten a lot since then, to be honest, because when you live in the Czech Republic and you listen to Czech, you lose the accent a little bit and there's a lot of words that you forget or you don't improve. So you really have to act actively work on your English every day, a little bit of listening, mm -hmm. a little bit of talking. Otherwise, you would uh, forget a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was it difficult? Uh, I mean the school because other subjects were in English as well. I yeah, suppose. Oh, everything. <laughs> yeah, so, no, so... there were no, there were no Czech people. There were no yeah. foreigners actually. There were just South Africans. So mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. uh... So, uh, except English, what about the other subjects? Was it difficult for you to, you know, learn the subject and also speak in English? Well, uh, it depended on the subject because, for example, mathematics was quite easy for me because that's just numbers, which are international. Yeah. So that was quite easy. But, for example, history uh, was a little harder because I had no idea what it was about. So the first year was I wasn't doing as well at the school as later on because I didn't speak the language well, well enough. Uh, mm -hmm. But later on, when I learned, when I understood more and uh, I was getting better at English, I wasn't struggling anymore. But in the beginning, I was struggling in the other subjects, but I, I had no problems in maths and in geography because geography mm -hmm. is maps and that's also international. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. Okay. And what about your return back to the Czech Republic? What mm -hmm. did you do? Did you, did you continue studying English or... What did you focus on? Uh, actually, I didn't learn any more English after that. I was 16 when I came back to the Czech Republic and I could speak uh, fluently English, so it was not necessary. And at that time, you know, it was still in the 90s, in the early 90s. So there was no TV. It was very hard to like watch anything. The only thing I could do was listen to music. So I was listening to a lot of music and trying to like translate the lyrics and things like that. Uh, but I basically didn't do much English um, at all. So, mm -hmm. and then I was actually focusing on, I, I'm a big lover of the French language. So I went to France several times and uh, I was learning French uh, in the, at high school. So that was the, and like other languages as well, but mainly French. Uh, okay, and then, so like how... later on, when I was a bit older, uh, I went, I, 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 you know, so well, sort of like rediscovered English. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, fine. So, how many languages can you speak? <laughs> so, <laughs> I... you, you know, sorry. Um, well, I can speak decently three languages, and I would <laughs> say like broken communicative, I would say five. Uh, but I'm always learning more because it's uh, it's fun to learn languages. I think it's a very enjoyable thing. It trains your brain a lot. 
and it's just a nice way you know you can learn about the um, the, the culture of the language of the languages so it's like not only the language but also learning about the the way people live about the way people think mm -hmm. you know there's this uh, saying in Czech uh, kolikrát si kolik jazyku umíš tolikrát si člověkem mm -hmm. and I think that is real you know like for example when I speak English I think I become a little bit of a different person Uh, so I think that can happen with other languages, you know, when you mm -hmm. travel to, let's say, Japan or to, uh, you know, South America, you know, you feel the culture and that's a part of the language learning. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I like about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so let's go back to your teenage years. Uh, what about your plans after high school? Uh -huh. What did you do? I... Uh, what did you plan to do? And... Did it come through? <laughs> well, actually, I, uh, I've always because I think that it was this time of the '90s when, you know, you could travel and the languages were like a big thing then. I think that it's a bit different today, where it's absolutely normal. Everybody's learning English. So and because I remember the Iron Curtain, I remember mm -hmm. I was young, but I still remember the fact that you could not travel. So I was really into languages. I was really into these cultures and foreign countries. So I actually wanted to, I went to try the, um, it's called Philosophical Faculta. In English, it's called Faculty of Arts. And uh, I got accepted uh, for the studies of English and French. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was a little bit, um, you know, more ambitious and I really wanted to study law. And I was accepted to the law school, so I dropped out of uh, the language uh, faculty and I went to the law school. So okay, but languages found you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know that you started teaching English. Is it correct? Yes, yes. Actually, yeah. I just said, okay, I'll give it a try, just for fun. You know, half okay. year. <laughs> That was my idea. <laughs> And here you are. Yeah, 20, <laughs> yeah. well, more than 20 years later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, what about that law studio? Um, you know, did you continue, I don't know, working in this area? Or um, after you finished the school, did you just, you know, jump to teaching immediately? Or um, can you tell more about the end of your studies? Well, the thing is that with law, if you really want to be a lawyer, you have to start working during the school, at least in those days. I don't know mm. how it is today, but in those days, if you want, but I never really did that because I was always teaching and always had enough students. And actually, I was earning quite good money for a student. So I just kept wanting to do it. And also, if you teach, it's a very long term process. You don't really do it for a month, but, you know, you see the progress of the student And then so you, you, you know, you just want to keep doing it because it, it just makes sense to you. Uh, so I was never really do. I never did any of the law practice. So when I finished my law school, I actually said to myself, okay, so now I'm going to be a lawyer. And I started working in a law office. And very soon I realized it's just not for me. It's too boring and very it's not that creative I'm a very creative person I mean it's a good job definitely but um, you know there's something missing for me so mm -hmm. I just went back to teaching and it's just become my full-time job okay okay so that's how you um, started um, recording videos or was there anything between you teaching and the videos did you do anything else or did you have your own uh classroom stuff like this well I never I actually wanted to finish teaching because when I had my child uh, I have a nine-year-old boy so when I was at home with him I uh, was looking for other things and I found a job as well uh, mm -hmm. in a totally like a company where I was really like doing a normal like office job mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I just tried to because in those times I just wanted to somehow because I had already been teaching for 15 years by then so I had a lot of mm -hmm. this like know-how and like information and notes so I just wanted to write a book but writing a book is not it's just too much so I just tried to record some videos just for fun 
and I put them on YouTube and then I could see like people started subscribing and they started to like like my videos, comment. So I said, okay, so maybe this makes sense. And then like slowly I learned how to do YouTube and, you know, I really like uh, the data. So I was looking at the data and mm -hmm. I discovered who, you know, what videos people enjoy, what makes sense to them. So I made more of those and slowly the YouTube channel grew. And uh, then I decided during COVID um, that I would just do this full time. So I quit my job mm -hmm. in the company uh, and I've been a freelancer since then. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the activities is uh, doing these YouTube videos and YouTube courses and not YouTube courses, video courses where you can buy them from me and, um, you know, doing things on social media. Mm -hmm. so you have you ever thought about teaching in schools i have would you enjoy would you enjoy that um i have and i must say i really admire anyone who can do it uh, because i personally have always had to just like one two maximum four or five students so and i think teaching these big groups of very different children who are very noisy and everyone is a little different is very hard so for me that was the main reason why i decided not to do it because it's just you know too much noise and it's not as easy as people think so i decided not to not to teach at school yeah, I should know <laughs> that it's not that easy. Yeah, especially, so, and especially in yeah. today's world when, where, sorry, to where, you know, there are children who have lessons from preschool and mm -hmm. there are children who can't even say hello when they are mm -hmm. you know, 10 years old. So it's very hard to to teach everyone as much, you know, to do mm -hmm. your best. And mm -hmm. that would be frustrating for me. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so so now you are a freelancer, is it correct? Mm -hmm. And so um are there many people like you in your field, many online teachers and many people who sell their English courses? Is um, there any competition? Mm -hmm. There is competition, definitely. And yeah. I think uh, the COVID changed the situation. It just mm -hmm. totally changed right. the, the whole situation altogether. You know, when I was deciding uh, what that, that I would do it, it was before COVID. So, and I, I know I said I was like one of uh, two or three or five people, very few people in the Czech Republic. And today it has just become so normal to talk on Zoom like mm -hmm. this. You know, the whole online mm -hmm adult education field is really uh it's just come online and people are used to it so there are much more people now so definitely mm -hmm. but so i just still try to do my best yeah. and i hope that people will learn from me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so uh my second question was if it's hard and difficult for you to be in a field where there are so many people like you who are selling their courses. Um, do you have any special strategy or um, how do you do it that you are so successful? Well, uh, thank you. That's very nice of you. <laughs> I don't think it's, I think it's, um, you know, for me, I like to think about things in terms of business. So, and I have this, and I always have new ideas coming to me. I'm always thinking about it, always developing the new ideas and, you know, watch what is going around me. So I think it's that that is the main key to, to sort of like understand what the people need and want and uh, also try not to satisfy everyone because that mm -hmm. doesn't make sense you can't teach children and you can't teach uh, doctors at the same time that doesn't mm -hmm. make sense so you have right. to you have to find your niche and mm -hmm. um that's what where yeah so so yeah i don't know what to say to that okay and do you compare yourself <coughs> to other um teachers that you might see online well, yes and no. Uh, I think you always need to know what is going on around you. But I think it's like in any field, any business, you just have to, you know, believe in yourself. You have to go your mm -hmm. way, and uh, the people will find you. So that's that's a big advantage of online learning. That you know, I even have students from abroad, which I find absolutely mm -hmm. amazing that there are people 
let's say living in England and uh, they they are taking care of their grandchildren and they learn English from me and I find this when I compare this to those 90s mm -hmm. <laughs> I was mm -hmm. telling you about I just find this absolutely amazing that uh, mm -hmm. what uh, and I'm very honored that the people actually learn from me because as you said there is a lot of competition but uh, I still feel that um, you you know there is something to give to the people and the people it's all about some kind of connection and about finding who is right for you so okay yeah fine and do you yeah we already know that you can use five languages <laughs> three three fluently or <laughs> i believe you said three and then two um so do you have any language goals or <laughs> you're done <laughs> Oh, I actually, when I was 20, I had the goal of knowing eight languages by the age of 50. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but but I had a 15 year yeah, break. So I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but definitely what, uh, because for me, I know a lot of, uh, because I can speak French and I can speak English, and I can speak German. So the European languages uh, don't really surprise me too much. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's quite similar. I mean, it, I don't mean to like brag or I don't mean to, um, what would be the word, under undermine these languages, but it's like kind of the same thing all the time. But for example, when you learn mm -hmm. Japanese, you know, it's totally new. It's everything, you know, the writing system, the grammar system. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning Japanese now. And my main reason, the main reason why I am doing that is that I actually want to be able to feel like the people that I teach English because I've never had that. I, you know, when I was in South Africa, it's just, I never had this feeling of, you know, not succeeding or anything like that. So, and with Japanese, it's really, <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> so, and I feel really you know, like, I have no idea what this is about. And I want to be able to help the students more uh, mm -hmm. by relating to them. That's so nice of you, really. Yay. Okay. Uh, so what's the biggest difference between English and that Japanese? You know, it must be really different. Do you, uh, can you, can you name one thing that is completely different except you know the writing system of course but what's totally different from English well I don't mean to sound like a Japanese expert and if there are any Japanese teachers <laughs> watching me please take it with a grain of salt I really don't know much Japanese at all uh, but for example the sentence structure is totally different you know mm -hmm. it's totally different and the whole system of you know, because Japanese is what you call the agglutination music, like agglutination language, where you have particles and you put things together. So mm -hmm. uh, you need to know what the things mean. But at the same time, the things that they have are different from what I already know. And that's the hardest part. You know, that's what I think is the hardest part when you have to learn, for example, when you learn chas. you know, we don't have that. And that's why it's hard for us. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. understand this concept, you know. Mm -hmm. So the like, if you have a word like voda, water, you just take what you already know and you just transfer it to a different language. That's all you do. But if you have new concepts that you can't use, that's the hard part of it. So I would say the whole structure of the language is totally different. And also, and that's what I think must be very hard for, for the English students, is that the words are totally different. So you have nothing to, you know, mm -hmm. to to compare them or to find some kind of connections mm -hmm. in what you already know. So it's much harder to remember because you don't, it, it doesn't make sense to you. Like, where did this come from? So that's, and I think that's the same when you're starting to learn English. Suddenly you have a word like, I don't know, decision, you know, rozhodnuki. Mm -hmm. It, where, what, why, what is this word? Yeah, so, it doesn't you know, even sound yeah. similar. Yeah. 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 So, so that's what, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. So good luck in your <laughs> learning Japanese. And now I would like to ask, what do you love most about English? 
but English. Uh, I think. Yeah. That's... No. What do you love most about English? About English. Uh huh. I think the best thing about English is that you can really talk to a lot of a very big part of the people in the world. It's just an international language, and it's like the lingua franca of today. So I think that mm -hmm. it's just you know you will you will be able to communicate with a lot of people that's the main thing and uh in terms of the structure i don't know i've never thought about that <laughs> maybe the fact that it's just um i think that for learning it is that it doesn't change the words it just has the same words and you don't have to change them in any way that's the heart and then there are some words that are really nice and that other languages can't express you know, English is a very, you know, it's a very like a business language and it has got, uh, it's not a very, it's not a very pretty language. It's a very straightforward and very organized. And that's what I, I like about the, about English. You know, it, it, it doesn't, I know I read somewhere, it cannot express <laughs> you know, they don't have those things, but they can express. What a great example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they can express, for example, deadline, which is one of my favorite English mm -hmm. words, which I find absolutely like fascinating. Deadline, <laughs> you will be dead if you, you know, it's just a lovely word. <laughs> you know, you know, it's so, so it's these like uh, these words uh, that are sometimes very exact and they convey the exact idea. That's what I like, um, that there are a lot of words uh, sorry, uh, a lot of words that are not in other languages and that, um, mm -hmm. you know, just have this, how would you say it, um, like a very pragmatic approach. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true. And it's so nice to see someone talking about English with such a passion <laughs> and love, <laughs> really. Okay, so my last question would be, um, what would you recommend to people who want to learn English and maybe are struggling with it because they might be like, you know, in their 40s and it's not so easy for them to start right away? Mm -hmm. I have two tips. The first one is don't put pressure on yourself. You know, don't uh, take it as I have to do it. It's something that everyone just don't put pressure on yourself. You know, don't say, you know, if you don't learn it fast enough, don't worry about it. It will take time. But and that's the, the other tip is make it your passion. Just find what you like about it. You know, as I was saying in the 90s, I only had those tapes. You know, <laughs> that's all I had. And I had no other access. But with the with today's world, there are so many different ways you can learn English, you can find your interests, you can watch YouTube videos, you can find teachers on italki, you can find friends on those platforms where people just want to chat English. You know, you can read about, uh, you know, if you have um, a hobby, you can read about your hobby, you can really do, you know, you can basically find anything on the internet and you can still be sitting on a couch in, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, Polichka or wherever, you know. <laughs> so just find your passion and find what you like and uh, keep doing it. And the third tip would be to make a system, to just stick to the system, you know, and to not say every day because every day is a bit too much. You will not stick to that. Just say, it all, okay, three times a week and then just keep doing it. And the progress will come. Okay, thank you for your tips. And thank you for this interview. <laughs> it was nice talking to you. It was very interesting. <laughs> Good.